Welcome everyone to the last session of the conference. Um, today I'll be talking about second source component probing on device tree platforms. Um, my name is Chen Yu Tai. I work on the kernel in for, for Chrome OS. Um, so just a disclaimer, um, the examples mentioned will mo most, uh, ma mainly focus on Chrome OS devices because that's just what I have. I've done some experiments and I've posted some patches, but this is pretty much an unsolved problem. Um, <clears throat> so I'll give a quick background on what we're dealing with, um, the current, current status of the things in the kernel, um, and some proposals of how I'm solving various um, parts of the problem. Um, so first of all, uh, component second sourcing. So what is second sourcing? Um, so when a vendor designs a device such as a laptop, um, they'll select various components for um, their design and sometimes multiple, component, uh, multiple sources will be chosen for a given component or the, the component could be swapped out later on because of shortages or end of life of a certain component. Um, the components are supposedly um, functionally similar, but that's only on the hardware end. Um, they provide the same function. They could be pin compatible, um, most likely not, um, unless they are like um, modular, uh, modularized through a common connector for things such as a display panel, your touchpad, your touchscreen. Um, and because they are different components from different vendors, they will require different power sequencing and different drivers. Um, and the hardware designers expect everything to be solved through software. Um, device trees. Uh, I think everyone here pretty much knows what a device tree is. It's a minimal description of non-discoverable hardware for your system. It's enough information for the, the operating system to enable and use the device. Um, it doesn't include any innumerable, innumerable devices such as USB, PCI Express, um, SDIO, that sort of thing. Unless these devices have non-discoverable properties, such as a regulator supply or GPIOs that need to be toggled for them to come to life. Um, so in the device tree, every device node would have a compatible, a compatible string, and that compatible string basically identifies which um, component this is. However, um, for the root node, the compatible string really doesn't do anything in the Linux, um, but some bootloaders will use that compatible string to use to basically identify what device that this whole device tree is for. Um, it's kind of a reverse um, mapping. And so one device tree could be used for multiple devices if they are look identical to Linux. Um, so you could also have different SKUs mapping to different compatible strings, and if you have variations in your components, then you, lead, you get more different compatible strings. Um, there's an, exact, an example here that shows the uh, MT8186 Core Solap uh, family of devices, which has this device called Magneton, and which has like two different SKUs. Um, the Chrome OS bootloader. So the Chrome OS bootloader um, uses fit images uh, to basically deliver the kernel. Um, the fit image includes one kernel image, a one kernel binary, and a whole bunch of device trees, and maybe some overlays. And also a bunch of configurations. One configuration maps to one kernel image plus one base device tree, and what zero or more overlays. And the configuration has a compatible string tied to it, and that currently is derived from the board level compatible string. And
And for us, the device trees are always bundled with the kernel and not the firmware. And so the bootloader knows what device it is. Um, it knows the family. So for instance, um, it could know that it is the device Kakadu. And then depending on the design, it could read an ADC for a resistor value or some GPIO strappings or maybe some EEPROM to figure out what the SKU number is, what the revision is. And then the bootloader generates a, a list of compatible strings to try. Uh, it goes through the fit image and tries to map match one of its compatible strings to one of the configurations in the fit image. And that's basically how the Chrome OS bootloader figures out like which device tree to use. Um, some related work, um, Elliot had a talk uh, yesterday about shipping multiple device trees. Um, a similar problem, but um, how we look up uh, which device tree to use is slightly different. Um, so our goal is to reduce the overall fit image. Um, you could re either reduce the kernel size or reduce the number of device trees bundled or reduce the sizes of the device trees bundled. Um, so this talk basically looks at decreasing the, either the number of device trees or the sizes of the device trees. And maybe try to move away from having to describe all the SKUs and the revisions in the compatible strings. Um, so the current status, uh, we have um, various design uh, variations. Um, so in some devices, we have the manufacturer switching between different types of uh, trackpads or touchscreens. And every time the manufacturer introduces a new um, trackpad, they will basically add a new device node to the existing device tree. And since the new component's I2C address does not conflict with the existing ones, they will simply add the new device node and they won't bother with allocating a new SKU identifier for it. And so you get this device tree which has three or four touchscreens or trackpads on the same I squared C bus, but on the actual device, only one of them actually exists. And this allows the uh, hardware vendors to basically swap around modules without um, having to reprogram either the bootloader or the EEPROM that contains like uh, identification numbers for the, the model. Um, and that's kind of what we already have in production. It's already seen um, in devices on market. Um, but that only covers like the simple situation where you don't have conflicts. And recently a manufacturer introduced a new trackpad that has an address conflict with existing components. Now in this case, you can't add two, com two device nodes with the same address because the device tree compiler would complain that either you have overriding device nodes or you would have to rename the device node and then the D DT maintainers would yell at you. Um, so basically they, what we did was we allocated a new SKU ID for this new variant. And now you have two separate device trees, one with the old uh, trackpads and the new device tree with just one trackpad, the new one. And now you have like basically two copies of almost identical uh, device trees. And the third thing that we have is um, hard to discover component changes. So I squared C um, components, you can sort of probe. You can basically send a transfer to that address and if it replies, then well, the device is there and maybe it's the correct one. But for things like uh, DSI panels uh, or cameras, um, 
that require certain power sequencing uh, commands. It's hard to actually probe these because you have to know ahead of time which sequence of commands to actually send. And so basically you have to have different SKU IDs and then different device trees. And so again, you end up with two almost identical device trees. Now the last class is um, innumerable, innumerable component changes um, that basically have identical device trees, but for some other reason, internally they have to um, allocate a new SKU ID for it. And therefore you kind of end up with two device trees that have completely matching um, information. And so that's basically what we have right now. It's kind of different workarounds for different situations. And it ends up causing like tens or tens of device trees for one family of device. And we'd like to like reduce the number. Um, so now I'll go through some of the solutions or proposals that solve one of one aspect of the the uh, the problem so for the device uh, for i squared c components that don't have conflicting um, conflicting addresses um, i squared c bus is not discoverable it's there's no enumeration the expectation is you describe the device in the device tree um, and it's possible to probe the device. So if you tell it that, okay, there's a trackpad at a given address, you can send a simple transfer and if it replies, then okay, maybe the trackpad is there. Um, but there's no guarantee that the device that actually responded to you is the device that you are expecting. Most i squared c components do not have a chip ID uh, that you can verify. Um, the only exception that I know of is i 2 c HID devices. They provide a fixed format descriptor. However, uh, the descriptor is not always at the same uh, register address. So the only um, the only stable way of probing things is just to send a simple transfer. Um, And so what we currently have is we have maybe three or four uh, trackpad nodes on the I2C bus, and those are all enabled. And so the kernel goes in and binds each device to their respective drivers, and the driver probes, and maybe the driver tries to verify that the device actually exists. And somewhere along the line, all the trackpad um, drivers got changed to uh, synchronous probing, so now all these drivers probe at the same time. However, um, your trackpad might need a regulator supply, it might need a GPIO line, it might need an interrupt line, and these become shared resources within the kernel. And so if you have three drivers probing at the same time and all requesting the same resources. For regulators, you can share them. GPIOs, maybe, maybe not. Um, interrupts, maybe, maybe not. But it requires, like, you have to fix all the drivers to make them share the resource, and they're typically not meant to be shared. Um, so what normally happens is you have three drivers probing at the same time. One of them requests the resource successfully and the other two fail. And then the first one probes the device and then the, the device is not there, it doesn't respond and then it fails and then you have nothing. Um, so that basically is kind of flaky. So you, you basically have maybe one will successful, successfully probe or maybe none of them will. And we've basically worked around it by moving some resources up a level into the I2C bus node 
And some, like the regulators, we just set them to always on. And in, for the interrupts, um, in the drivers, we've moved the request IRQ call to after the I2C probe, uh, I2C transfer probing. And these are all workarounds, ex especially the device tree where we move the resources up one, one level. Um, that does not match the actual hardware. Well, and well, we've been asked, can't you do probing in firmware? And sure, that's doable. Um, the ThinkPad X13S with the Qualcomm SOC actually does this. Um, but then it doesn't pass the uh, result to the OS if you're wanting to boot Linux. And either the firmware has to pass the result to Linux in some other fashion, or it has to um, modify the device tree to basically hook up or add the node that it probed. And in some cases, you might not want to do this. Um, you might not want to tie your firmware to your kernel in such a tight way because when you ship the device, um, your either your bindings might not have been vetted or reviewed by upstream. Um, your devices might have been under embargo and you couldn't have sent patches. Um, or you had some downstream kernel tree and then that doesn't match upstream. Um, on the, in addition, um, Firmware should just do enough to get you to whatever you're booting, and it shouldn't really do too much to uh, to, to like probe the system hardware. Um, basically, anything that can initial be initialized by the, the, the operating system, it should leave to the operating system. And also, in some cases, for like for Chrome OS, part of the firmware is read-only. It cannot be updated once it leaves the factory. Um, so in this case, um, I've put together a, basically a platform device driver, which basically tries to probe um, all the trackpads or your touch screens or whatever. Um, so what you do is you mark the trackpads in the device tree as disabled or failed needs probe. And this driver will basically go through the device tree and see which nodes need probing, and it will uh, probe them one by one and do power sequencing as needed. And if optimized, they could just do the power sequencing once, and you would power everything on and do the probe quickly. And then once it finds one that it actually exists, it will enable the device in the device tree and pass it on to the kernel and let the kernel do its usual thing. Um, and the patches are on the patch, uh, on the mailing list, and that works pretty well. Um, I still need to add like GPIO and regulator support for this series. Um, so that's one case where the these are targeted only at I squared C devices that don't have address conflicts. Um, if you do have a conflict, then it gets terribly uh, complicated. You have to have different device trees. Um, so, if you if you do have um, some sort of identifier from the firmware or from your device in hardware. Um, that tells you which variant this hardware that you're booting on is, then you could pre presumably uh, know which device is currently on your hardware. Um, so in this case, we could say list all the possible components in the device tree and mark them as uh, disabled. And then there's a platform driver that reads the identifier and then it knows which components to enable either by compatible string or by path. Uh, presumably by compatible string is better. Um, there are also patches for this. Um, the one thing that we've heard from the DT maintainers is do not generate the device nodes on the fly. You should have them 
in the device tree and just disabled. And then your, your driver or whatever can go through and pro enable the correct one. Um, so this lets you basically merge different SKUs into the one common device tree. However, it pushes some of this logic into the kernel. And if you're, for example, merging multiple um, panels or like camera sensors, which are part of uh, a device tree graph, an OF graph, um, the device tree compiler will now complain that you have one or more uh, graph endpoints that does not have in a remote have a remote endpoint, which basically it will complain that you have an incomplete graph. And I think we've talked to Christoph a bit earlier about this, but um, I guess this, this could be solved through changing the device tree compiler and telling it to ignore this class of error. Um, so this is basically doing um, enabling certain components within the kernel. And that might not be as tasteful to some people. Um, they might want to have like nothing in the kernel. Um, so in another way, you could have per variant overlays if your bootloader supports uh, applying overlays and you have some, some way to specify like which device should have uh, which overlays applied. Um, so in, for Chrome OS hardware, we normally have one or more reference designs for a given platform, say for like um, MT8195 or Intel um, Raptor Lake or something. And then there could be one or more design dev deviations by the o ODMs. And then we'll kick off one or more projects based on that design. And each project will have one or more SKUs tied to it. So the SKUs could be, sorry, different RAM chips, different storage options, different Wi-Fi chip, uh, different display panel, different camera sensor, different touchpad trackpads, touch screens, whatever. Um, the, the SKU variants go on and on. So for instance, the MT8186 SOC platform had, has two reference designs and one wasn't actually chosen for anything, um, which is called, and the other is called Krabby and we have like a DCSI file for it. And that got selected for the Tentacruel project which has a number of SKUs. So that's a number of device tree files. And then there's a deviation, uh, a derivation design called Steelix that was done by the ODM. And that produced two or more projects called Steelix and Magneton. And those also have a number of SKUs. Um, so currently in tree, we have like one device tree for every SKU. So the 8183 Kukui family has 10 device trees. The 8183 Jacuzzi family has 17. Um, 8186 Corsola family has 10 and more to come. And basically because they are all derived or including the same DTSI files, you basically are duplicating most of the design um, in, into each device tree blob. And that adds up to um, kind of a lot. Um, now say we could take all the, um, all the design aspects that are common to a given device and put them in a device tree blob and move all the skew variant variations such as a different trackpad or a different touch panel into an overlay. So we convert basically the device DTSI file into a DTS file and all the SKU DTS files into uh, DTSO files or device tree source overlay files. And in the bootloader, we ask the bootloader to 
basically take the base device tree blob and apply the overlay on top of it. And this basically allows you to deduplicate all the changes within a certain family or within, for a certain device. Um, so when you enable overlays, you basically increase the file size of the individual blobs um, because of symbols and fix-up tables and omit if not ref ignored and also um, extra vandals for every device node that has a label. Um, however, if you have um, bootloader support for overlays and you package just the base device tree and the overlays, you can save a lot of space for, for your overall image. Um, so in, in our case, in this case, there's like a 6.6% savings. Um, or 6.7% percent savings if you just merge one device um, into the scheme I just mentioned. Um, of course, that number is minuscule compared to the actual kernel image size. Um, now, we could also expand this to cover, have one device tree blob for the whole family of devices, and then we would have overlays for per device changes and per SKU changes. And that would be like two layers of overlays. And you would basically cut down all the uh, duplicate um, device trees into just one base. Um, now the issues with this is this basically changes how the device tree files are managed. You used to have a bunch of include files and then you'd have your uh, final device, uh, device tree source for your device. Um, now you would have one base either for, this, uh, for the family of devices or for the, fa uh, the device. Then you'd have a bunch of overlays that need to be stacked on top. And for, for, the, um, for the maintainer, the maintainer has to basically know that these get stacked together. And also when viewing, it's kind of different. And also it incre increases the uh, device tree blob size. And the uh, delete property and delete node commands used in the device tree source no longer work. Um, you can only use these two commands within the same device tree source file. Um, once they compi get compiled, the, the commands no longer exist in the blob. And also device tree validation might not work as intended. Um, device tree validation happens with each um, invocation of the device tree compiler. So the base gets validated once and then the overlays get validated separately. And however, the composite um, DTB, the, the base with the overlay does not get validated. And also you need bootloader supply uh, support for overlays to actually um, use the overlays. Um, so we could also use like, instead of per SKU or per device overlays, we could change it up and use per component um, overlays and you would specify one overlay for each component that you have and you basically in your fit image or whatever packing method you use, you basically specify um, how you want to stack your over overlays. Um, it's still a lot of files if you have a lot of uh, component um, sources, but it does kind of reduce the number of combinations because instead of combination, uh, one device tree overlay for each combination, now you have to you only have one device tree overlay for each um, component. Um, I'm going to speed through this, sorry. Um, so basically the kernel would produce the base device tree blob and all the feature overlays and the bootloader would no, you know, still use the, the compatible strings that we had before and basically pick out which configuration to use. but 
for the configuration, each compatible string would map to one base and then all the components it has. Um, but then you'd have to either store this mapping somewhere out of tree or try to embed it into your um, overlays, which is either way is going to be messy. Um, and some people might say it's uh, hard to maintain. And the other possible way to do it is with fit image extensions. Um, this was proposed by Simon Glass um, on the U-Boot mailing list. Um, it basically s describes a scheme for fit images to have extensions for certain configurations, and those extensions point to certain overlays that can be applied, and the extensions also have dependencies that you can specify. However, it's only a proposal for the fit image format, and it doesn't cover things such as how you store or manage the, the mapping and the dependencies. Um, and also, um, it doesn't cover the, the case where you have multiple overlays um, when applied. Don't override the base, uh, the root compatible string, and you have um, multiple configurations with the same uh, compatible string. Um, so, for the non-conflicting I squared C component change case, we have uh, we can do com coordinated probing for for that case, um, and it works better than just having the kernel randomly probe each driver. Um, design and component changes will cause changes in the device tree files, and you'll have many more device tree files you have to to maintain. And there's various options that you can do to reduce the duplication, but all come with trade-offs. Um, and I don't think there's like one size fits all solution to this. So the main purpose of this talk is to like show you what um, solutions I've come up with and maybe you could discuss like what works for which case. And that's about it. So any questions? Yeah, in Linux, uh, device drivers all loadable, right? So they ha do they have independent uh, code that you develop? I'm sorry, I don't quite get the. Question. So how do you build a tree? Are they uh, relocatable object? Uh, no. A tree? No, the the device driver itself. Um. So. I guess the device driver is within the kernel tree and it's either built in or as a module separately loaded. And right. yeah. So what that, that when you create a uh, device driver module, do you have to create a position independent code? Um, oh, you don't know. That's okay. Uh, so th the scheme we I use now is just basically when there's the, each module would have an init code, and in the init code, it would create a platform drive device yeah. that yeah. matches the device driver, and the device drive the, the device driver or the manager device driver gets probed, and that will do all the probing. Yeah, no, actually, the, the, the word probe, I don't know, you use it probably different than I how I understand it, but that, that's okay then. Okay. I think K build takes care of all the position independent code. K-Build will take care of, and like when you load the module, the, your driver module, that'll take care of but any. You create the object itself, you have to make sure that it's independent so that way you can yeah. load any way you want. Yeah, you kernel takes care of that. If you have a static address space, then the, the boot loader or whatever, that loader, the device driver has to know where to put it at. Yeah, the, 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 the build system. You go to a different device driver and see. Oh, no, this yeah. isn't like. Deciding which drivers to load. This is deciding no, it's, which it's, devices it's, to probe. This isn't deciding which driver to load. It's 
probing or accessing the I squared C bus and checking which device actually is there and then enabling that device node in the device tree. So you have devices listed in the device tree that are currently disabled and you tell the kernel to enable this one. Yeah, so you, you can't really do, like you can't do direct hooks in the kernel. You have to have something that starts it. Okay. Yeah. I was just gonna comment. I was surprised to see that your device tree, like when you do an overlay, your savings are not that high. Um, I, at least in, from what I can see you know, in Qualcomm. Yeah, so. I haven't taken measurements in a while, but in my mind, it's all those symbols and fix, up, fix ups I can't imagine, I mean, I hope they're not taking, even if they take the exact same size, you know, doubles the size of the DTB, uh -huh. you only need to have two overlays before it starts giving you savings. Um, yeah, so the numbers are for the whole family that's bundled, but only one of them is converted. So it's like, um, I guess out of 30 DTBs, only four are converted. So it's not the whole thing. Oh, okay. I forgot to put the actual, like okay, one, device numbers into here. Okay, so this is only Sorry. like a few have been converted. Yeah. And so, okay, yeah. yeah. So. But overall, I think one thing to, to look at this is, as Chen Yu said, is that even the device trees, all of them together are still not a giant chunk of the kernel. Yeah, so right? the, the whole bunch of device tree blobs is like, I don't know, hundreds of kilobytes, and the kernel image compressed is something like 12, 13 megabit, megabytes. Right. No, I, I just was thinking you'd have to see higher savings. It's still a good a decrease, so I'm just surprised it's not more. Um, I, I think doing the trying, just put all your nodes in the device tree, like you were talking about for R squared C, and just see if it probes yeah. is actually really interesting, um, especially since I think hopefully we're going to start to see more devices trying to be supported upstream. Yeah, um, so we so have this, and also the ThinkPad 13S has this, yeah. and Basically, you have to do a dance with all the device drivers to make it not fall over. Yeah. And that's really ugly. So I talked to Wolfram last year about this, and I basically explained the whole scheme to him. And he's like, oh, God, this is so... <laughs> maybe we should talk to, like, Servana from Device Link and see if maybe he has thoughts um... on it. I, I don't know. I, I don't think Device Links has any way to say it these things are mutually exclusive. So the mutually exclusive group thing was proposed by Doug and then shot down by Rob, so. <laughs> I mean, he did give other alternatives. I think we could have made it work if we kept, if we keep working at it, I think we can make uh -huh. that work. I think it doesn't solve every problem, but I think. Yeah, it only solves the yeah, right. non-conflicting one. It solves the, non, the non-conflicting ones really, really well. Yeah. Uh, because it just totally gets rid of the whole explosion thing, right? Like you just see all the possibilities in the same device tree and not having the overlays to conceptually worry about and all that, it, it's just really nice. And so it solves that problem well for a lot of simple cases and it, it may be worth doing. And, and I, think we could, I think we could get it solved and we could get it landed uh, with enough spinning and coordination. I think there's enough agreement that it's useful. Yeah. But I think also it's a little bit discouraging to work on because it doesn't solve every case, right? Like it doesn't solve the dual MIPI panels and it doesn't solve, you know, some of the more complicated cases where you have all these graphs and things that don't, don't live in the same device tree very well, so. I mean, I, I just am thinking from the perspective of we're gonna see more devices coming upstream and so just it'd be nice if we had an easier solution for some cases that, yeah. yeah. It feels uh, like we, we, we want both. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Overlay. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the only reason I was bringing up Servana was because you were talking about asynchronously probing, and mm -hmm. that just in my mind yeah. brought up Servana. So, um, yeah. Any other questions, or are we all headed to the closing game? Okay. 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 Yes. That's it then. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>